the general mission of the Nike program was last ditch defense. Uh, these missiles were radar guided surface to air missiles. They were the first ones to deploy missiles to be of that nature. And there were three missiles in the Nike family. You had the Nike Ajax right over here, one over to the far right. Nike Ajax, you had the Nike Hercules, which is the one we'll have a chance to see this afternoon in a little bit. That was the perfect Nike Hercules missile in one of the hangars. And there was also the Nike Zoo. Miami Gardens, what was then Carroll City. Uh, C Battery pretty much as soon as it was deactivated in 1979, it was turned into shopping malls and banks, etc. If you go see it today, you could never tell there was a, a missile installation there. And lastly, we would have D Battery, where the Tam Miami Trail meets Chrome Avenue. That's just east of our Shark Valley into today. Uh, today, that property belongs to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and much like with the other, three the other two batteries, you really couldn't ever tell it was a Nike installation. By far the best preserved relic of the Cold War is Alpha Battery. The battery we'll have a chance to visit today. Um, and like I mentioned, they would come here at the very end of October 1962. Now, for the most part, um, throughout the Cold War, and actually throughout the Cold War and the, and the height of the Cold War, 60s and 70s, we had over 250 of these Nike missile batteries spread out throughout the country. If you all lived in or near a major city back in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, you all very likely had uh, these Nike batteries providing air defense to your, yourself and your neighbors. Uh, down here in South Florida, we would have four of them that would arrive at the end of October. And for the most part, uh, they didn't come down here until October 1962 because the United States military uh, didn't feel it's very necessary to go ahead and provide air defense for South Florida. Uh, for the most part, after World War II and in the early days of the Cold War, uh, the United States became very fearful of attack coming over from the Soviet Union. Uh, and if, of course, you go ahead and think of the globe, you think of geography, if attacks didn't come over from the Soviet Union to the United States, you're probably thinking over the North Pole. And so for the most part, they went ahead and they fortified Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, all along the American-Canadian border, New England, etc., mainly left out the Southeast region and certainly left out South Florida. Uh, that, of course, all changed uh, in the middle of October of 1962. October 14, 1962, we have an American spy plane flying reconnaissance over Cuba, only about 130 miles south of where we are right now. That spy plane goes ahead and photographs uh, offensive nuclear missiles being assembled on the island of Cuba, being supplied by the Soviet Union. Uh, these missiles are medium range in nature and they can reach Washington DC in 12 minutes. Uh, that of course uh, went ahead and immediately set up alarm and panic over in Washington DC. South Florida was exposed as a nation's Achilles heel. We really had no air defenses down here. Pretty much overnight of course they began mobilizing military units down here. Uh, again, the men of Alpha Battery would arrive just two weeks later uh, from Fort Bliss, Texas, where they would all train. Uh, and after the discovery of those missiles, uh, went ahead and pretty much, uh, of course, began uh, the 13 days in October. And for those 13 days, uh, the world pretty much came as close as it has ever come uh, to all-out nuclear war and to World War III. Uh, the Cold War, of course, was a very tense, uh, tense times, a uh, very tough uh, a period, of, of course, of, our, of the world's history. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis is easily the most tense passion of the Cold War. Again, the world came as close as it had ever been, and as close as it ever has been, uh, to nuclear war. Um, now, as, uh, as the days go on, of course, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, we go ahead and we begin to notice kind of attitudes changing between Premier Khrushchev and President John F. Kennedy of the United States. Uh, both were men, of course, that had served in World War II. Uh, John F. Kennedy had lost a brother in World War II, uh, Premier Khrushchev had lost a son, and they both realized neither of them really wanted to do this. Uh, it was pretty obvious this would be a war that neither, no, no one was really going to win, uh, and so we begin to see attitudes changing. Now we know of letters that they would exchange between each other, and also letters uh, that their wives would go ahead and exchange as well. You can see those attitudes changing. Uh, but of course, there was things that took place out in the field that neither really uh, President Kennedy or Premier Khrushchev could go ahead and readily control. October 26, 1962 would go on to be known as Black Saturday, a day some of you probably remember. Um, and so Black Saturday was easily the most tense day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
There was a few events that took place in the field, again, that neither Kennedy or Khrushchev had really any handle on. Any one of them could have easily started the firing, easily set off World War III. Uh, for one, uh, the United States went ahead and forced a Soviet submarine to surface over in the Florida Straits. Um, the United States had gone ahead and established a naval blockade of the island of Cuba a few days earlier. Uh, so we had a Soviet submarine forced to surface. Uh, we also had a young American pilot flying um, over, the, over the North Pole, actually became lost over Soviet airspace on Black Saturday. Uh, very thankfully for that young man, he was able to find a rural airstrip out in Alaska and he was saved. That would not be the case for Major Rudolf Anderson, who was uh, flying an U- American U-2 over Cuba and actually shot and killed. Uh, we went ahead and we actually lost a pilot on Black Saturday. Thinking about it today, how that didn't go ahead and start off the shooting uh, is really uh, a miracle, really, uh, fairly remarkable. Now, uh, also on the evening of Black Saturday, uh, President Kennedy sent his brother Bobby Kennedy, then the Attorney General of the United States, to go ahead and meet with the Soviet ambassador. Uh, they go ahead and they try to discuss resolutions for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And for the most part, uh, they agree on fairly simple terms. The United States would pledge to never invade Cuba, and in exchange, the Soviet Union would go ahead and withdraw its missiles from Cuba under the supervision of the United Nations. Um, so that was uh, what they went ahead and sat down on. That was the evening of Black Saturday. Uh, Black Saturday, again, easily the most tense day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Sunday came around, of course, and in the words of my co-worker, Leon Howell, who was alive at the time, who was a teenager then, there was two big surprises on Sunday. And the first big surprise was that we woke up. A lot of people went to bed on Black Saturday not knowing if they were going to go ahead and see the, see the next day. Uh, but, of course, they did. Um, and, of course, not only did people wake up, the other big news was radi- uh, Moscow had accepted our terms. Uh, they would go ahead and withdraw their missiles from Cuba. Uh, we would go ahead and pledge to never invade Cuba. And that was, for the most part, what came to be the formal end of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, by no means, of course, was the Cold War over. It would go on for many, many more years. Uh, the men of Alpha Battery and the other three batteries in uh, South Florida uh, would go ahead and uh, leave Fort Bliss, Texas on October 28, 1962. The very next day, they would arrive here three days later, October 31, 1962. Because of the immediate way they deployed when they first came down here, uh, the men of Alpha Battery and the other three batteries in South Florida did not have any permanent facilities set up. All the facilities that we see here and that we'll see in the launch area didn't come around until about 1965, almost a whole three years later after they were deployed. When they first came down here, they set up in temporary sites in the bean and tomato fields right outside Everglades National Park today. Uh, they would go ahead and work and live out of there for the next three years. We'll talk more about that once we're in the launch area. And again, they would set up uh, for the next 17 years here in South Florida, providing air defense for the nation and for this region. Uh, now, there, aside from the four Nike batteries that would come down here, there was also eight Hawk batteries that would come down to South Florida as well. Uh, there was four that would be out in Homestead, Miami. And so- Homestead, Miami would be the only place in the country where Hawk and Nike missile batteries would be fully integrated. And aside from the four Hawk batteries in South Florida, we would have four other Hawk batteries lined up along Highway 1 into the Florida Keys, with the very last Hawk battery being down in Key West, only 90 miles away from Cuba. Um, so by all means, from everything I've heard, everything I've read, South Florida pretty much transformed from a touristy, laid-back area uh, to pretty much a military operation, military town, almost overnight after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and by the way, the Hawk batteries would be shorter range, lower altitude missiles. Now, the of the 250 uh, Nike sites here in the country, uh, the four here in South Florida would be a little bit different. The story here would be different. For one, like I shared with you at the beginning, uh, the general mission of the Nike program was last ditch defense. That would be different here in South Florida. If anything was coming over from Cuba to the United States, South Florida would be ground zero. Last ditch defense was not necessarily the mission down here. It was a little bit different. Uh, and then also, uh, the second missile battalion that came down here to South Florida uh, would, be, would be the only one deployed under duress. Again, they pretty much came over overnight. They had no permanent facility set up for them. They would set up right outside the park due to the immediate nature of the situation of the crisis. Um, now, all 250, so again, these four would be unique. All 250 of them, though, would share several areas in common. For the most part, Nike batteries are set up of, were made up of three different areas. Oh, no, just take the whole thing. Thank you, though. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and so we're going to walk out back over there and we'll talk more about this component on the battery and we'll go ahead and we'll talk about the other components that make up every Nike battery. Uh, so all those, these here would be different. They would all share certain things in common. We're going to walk out back there. Watch your steps on the... Uh,